Breaking Rank is an insider account of American policing from former Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper. This talk from the University Bookstore in Tacoma, Washington is about an hour. Now, I don't think that Mr. Stamper needs any introduction from me. It looks like you're all good friends with him. We're just so thrilled to have him. I attended a Bruce Springsteen concert about a week ago, and I'm almost excited about this as I was about that. Oh, um, you're <laughs> stretching your credibility. I know, it's just such an honor to have somebody who, who, who former police chief for, for 35 years, who did so much to uh, change the way th things were handled in the police department, especially when it comes to domestic violence. And I think of all the things you could have done, especially when you run for mayor. <laughs> so um, the book is fabulous. Ann Rule says that it is shocking and hysterical <laughs> <laughs> and illuminating. So um, I'm not going to waste your time anymore. Just Mr. Stamper, take it away. Thank you so much for coming. Thank it's you. just a real honor. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Laura. Jack, right? Yes, yes, wants some yes, coffee? In person, nice to meet you. This evening I've met two people with whom I've been in correspondence for a long, long time and actually have now been able to match a face to the, to the unending series of emails and uh, it's very nice to see all of you here tonight. What I thought I would do this evening is talk to you a little bit about why I wrote this book uh, and in the process uh, share some information about its structure, uh, then do a little bit of reading, and, uh, and then take questions uh, or listen to concerns that you may have based on anything that's either in the book or that I may say tonight that triggers any kind of a reaction. And I'll begin by saying that I think uh, policing, uh, American policing, is strategically located in our society to accomplish two major purposes that means so much to every single one of us uh, as Americans. The first is its crime-fighting mission, the prevention of crime, the enforcement of criminal statutes, and helping to create and sustain safe and healthy neighborhoods, the basic core mission of policing. I also see it, however, as, the, as a basic core mission that police officers uphold constitutional rights and due process guarantees of each and every one of us. Guaranteeing civil liberties and actually contributing to social justice by working lawfully to improve neighborhoods and communities and to make them safe uh, is seen by a lot of people as either uh, oxymoronic or just plain moronic. You can't possibly uh, do one and the other, so it has to be an either-or proposition. And I think that is a fundamental failing in logic, particularly given the structure of government that we have in this country. So reason number one for writing the book was to express concerns that I have had throughout most of my career, certainly not my rookie year, but most of my career, uh, about the institution itself, the structure, the paramilitary bureaucratic organizational arrangement, and all of the problems that result from that kind of institutional structure. There are laws as well that police are called upon to enforce that help to contribute to a very antagonistic, sometimes a, 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 almost always adversarial relationship between police officers and very large classes of people in our society. And I'll be talking about that in just a few moments. So reason number one is all about reform reform in the structure of policing, reform in some of the laws that police officers are called upon to enforce on behalf of each of us. The second motivation for writing this book was to give myself an opportunity to explore why I became a cop in the first place in 1966 uh, and how breathtakingly quick and easy it was for me uh, to morph from a vaguely idealistic 21-year-old uh, kid into um, a reckless, abusive police officer during my rookie year. Uh, a rookie year that I hasten to add I enjoyed very much. I enjoyed the power, I enjoyed abusing other citizens. That becomes very important it seems to me as we, as we do some soul searching and institutional analysis of policing. So 
that's kind of the introduction. The book is, uh, as it's been called by my publisher, is part polemic. That's the political piece and part memoir, which is obviously a bit of my own story. So what I'd like to do is just read some excerpts. I'll be skipping around quite a bit, but I think you'll see that there is something resembling a theme uh, to the reading this evening. And then once again, I want to reserve as much time as possible for conversation with you. So if I can uh, work my way through these <clears throat> highly organized notes. I'm at a meeting on Capitol Hill in Seattle. I get beeped. There's been a shooting. An address shows up on my pager and I know right where it is. It's across the street from Common Ground, a social services agency that oversees the safe transfer of children in joint custody cases. You know, mom drops a kid off at 8 o'clock, dad picks the uh, child up at 8.15. Dad returns the kid at 5, mom picks the child up at 5.15. That, why, th that way mom and dad just don't have to see each other, presumably making it safe. I glide my vehicle under the outer perimeter tape held high by two of my officers and pull up to the inner perimeter. A car is parked facing south in the northbound lane, its driver's door open, its dome light on. Lieutenant Harry Bailey says, I thought you'd want to roll on this one, boss. He's right, and he's wrong. Behind the wheel of the car is the sprawled body of a woman dressed in business attire. She's dead. In back, buckled snugly into her car seat, a little girl, about two. White tights, patent leather shoes, plaid skirt, puffy, oversized nylon jacket. Dark curly hair, long eyelashes, the face of an angel. Her eyes are wide open, her two little fists clenched. She's also dead, shot through the chest. A week later, her father, Carl Edwards, shot himself as the CHP moved in on him uh, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. What do you see when you picture a safe America? I envision infants born into, loving, into a loving, nurturing world, to women whose reproductive rights are protected by law, children and teens who exhibit consideration for themselves and for others, and, who, and, and, and citizens who question and challenge and disagree with one another nonviolently men who refuse to abuse women. Gun violence gone from our homes and our streets, our schools and our workplaces. Law enforcers from the beat cop to the attorney general doing their jobs properly, applying their imagination, playing by the rules. I see Americans black, white, straight, gay, expressing themselves freely, pursuing happiness as they define it. I picture an America safe from consumer, environmental, and political as well as predatory crime, and free from the specter of an overzealous, overreaching, moralistic government. As uh, I think most people in this city know who know anything about the book, chapter one is an open letter to a bad cop. That bad cop is David Brame. In this chapter, I talk about my own abuse uh, of each of my three ex-spouses. That my violence never led to bruises or cuts or broken bones, much less uh, a 45 bullet to the head makes my violence uh, directed at someone I purported to love no less acceptable. And throughout our society, it seems to me, if we recognize that violence in the home is a precursor to violence everywhere, everywhere then we will, in fact, uh, muster the courage 
the money, the priorities we need to, in fact, do everything in our power to prevent domestic violence. Research over the past three decades supports the conventional wisdom. Witness your parents fighting. Statistically, you're likely to grow into a batterer yourself. Beaten as a child, odds are you'll beat your own kids. If you're both a witness to and a victim of family abuse, your chances of becoming a partner beater and or a child abuser, unless you have some remarkable coping skills or some other adult to turn to for support, are just off the charts. And God forbid you should grow up in a household where violence is the norm. Spousal assault, child assault, and everyday vocabulary of violence. Eat those peas or I'll kick your ass. Wipe that smirk off your face or I'll slap it off. And yes, mega doses of TV and video game violence. If you come from that kind of home, and so many American children do, the chances are slight that you'll not settle differences with your fist or a hammer or a gun. Either that, says the research, or you'll turn out pathologically passive. In my letter to David, I, uh, I ask him about his attitudes toward women and where he got them, and I think it's important that we consider that. I also think it's in important that we focus on the behavior, no matter what may have produced or contributed to it. The pushing, the threats to kill her, the choking, David, four episodes in the year before you murdered her, the angry display of your firearm. I hate to say it, but that stuff's not all uncommon among young male cops or older male cops or men in general. But you did some certifiably weird things too. You sent her flowers with no card so you could study her reaction. You timed her every trip from the house. You checked the odometer on her car. You accompanied her to the bathroom and into her, into her gynecological exams. You weighed her daily. You handled all the money, giving her a miserly allowance, then accounting for it like a cross between Scrooge and Attila the Hun. I wonder, David, if you also listened in on her phone conversations, read her mail, followed her, interrogated her when she got home, demanding to know what she did, who she was with, expected or demanded sex when she didn't want it. This list has 51 items. I'll spare you the time. You're probably familiar with it. If not, please read David Paymore. Uh, very, very important to know the signs and symptoms of, of a batter. The whole world knows the answer to the last two questions, David. Did you fight in front of the kids? Did you use violence against her? On October, excuse me, on April the 26th, uh, 2003, we do know that David Brame shot and killed his wife, then himself, in front of his eight-year-old daughter and his five-year-old son. I've been married and divorced three times. I recall what it was like to be provoked the rage that welled up inside when I felt jealous or possessive or disrespected or insecure. I did things I regret, and since I'm not shy about judging you, I'll tell you what they are. I screamed profanities at my wife in front of the kids, two stepchildren from the second marriage, my own from the first. I turned cold, gave her the silent treatment, once slammed my fist into the wall, interrogated her when she returned home. Surely she had been sleeping or at least flirting with someone else. I glared at her, drove at breakneck speeds with her in the car, lifted her and moved her when she refused to get out of a doorway so I could leave, which is to say escape. That was my favorite tactic. Get to the car, roll down all the windows, motor like a madman into the mountains or out onto the desert floor, 
uh, until I had calmed down and regained something uh, of my senses. Which wife doesn't matter. I behaved the same way with each habitually. The worst thing I ever did from where I sit was to stand above the woman I loved and rain down madness upon her. I was carrying my seventh or eighth of my nine badges by then, each new professional milestone symbolizing in my delusional mind the parallel progress I had been making in personal growth, in enlightenment. My partner was asleep at the time on a futon on the floor. She hadn't returned my calls, wouldn't commit to some office holiday function I had felt professionally obligated to attend. <clears throat> she had ignored me. So I towered some six feet above her in a darkened room and roared, berating her, accusing her, intimidating her. All I lacked was the belt that my father had used frequently on me. I talk about the differences between David Brame and, and me, um, the most important of which from my perspective is that I got help and he didn't. Uh, the woman I just described was a clinical psychologist and she insisted that if uh, we were to become wife and husband I would in fact undergo therapy. And <clears throat> I didn't need work, I didn't need therapy, I was a pretty happy person. Yes, occasionally I shouted and occasionally I said things I regretted, but for God's sakes that wasn't domestic violence. That wasn't even really emotional abuse, that was just, you know, anger. While I never entertained the thought of physically attacking my partner, I knew it was in there, percolating the potential for physically wounding violence. Therapy was a great gift. It helped me understand and deal with the sources of my childhood wounds and my adult insecurities. It informed me that my parents' discipline, especially my father's, was as unlawful as it was ineffective. It reinforced my fundamental belief in the moral and liberating value of true gender equality. And it erased any excuse I may have had for my behavior. I was responsible, not mommy, not daddy, not God, not Twinkies, and certainly not my partner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, since I'm in a confessional uh, mood this evening, chapter two seems to be in order. I floated into the conference room and settled into a chair that seemed to have been constructed of warm air and goose down. A moment later, my colleagues filtered in, in slow motion, the contours of their bodies blurring into gold and cerulean auras. These were the finest individuals in the universe, worthy, noble, virtuous. It was a marvelous meeting each person respectful, no one interrupting, everyone agreeing with my point of view on every item on the agenda. It was a perfect Perkadan day. <laughs> Alcohol had always been my drug of choice, but in the mid 80s I went to work with my pockets full of painkillers. I popped them throughout the day, long after the misery of a failed kidney stone extraction had worn off. Administrative problems vanished or lost their weight. Organizational enemies became pals. Dreaded bureaucratic meetings turned into pleasant, almost cosmic out-of-body experiences. And I wasn't the only doper in government. There were far more consequential personages into the drug scene. Richard Nixon, depressed over the public's reaction to Vietnam and Watergate, scored a dealer volume supply of Delantin and wolfed down hundreds if not thousands of the mood altering caps from 1970 through the end of his presidency in 1974. 
Bill Clinton denied inhaling but confessed to puffing. Al Gore copped to being a heavy weed smoker in college. George W. Bush refuses to refute accounts he was a coaxer in school. And Marion Barry? <laughs> Please. <laughs> Where does it end? It doesn't. And it's not just politicians, of course, or the occasional police official. It's everybody. At least every demographic is well represented, including shock talk radio hosts like Rush Limbaugh, who's housekeeper kept him supplied with cigar boxes full of Oxycontin and other narcotics. We do like our drugs. And so what? If I want to ingest, inject, sniff, snort, inhale a mood or mind-altering substance, whether to find God, flee problems, or just feel good, that is my business. And that is how I feel. That is how I have felt for many, many years. I don't believe I have that right if I'm piloting a plane, um, serving as, a, as the uh, engineer on a train, or given that I live on Orcas Island, piloting ferry boats within the San Juans. And there are a number of other occupations where I believe it is absolutely essential that we satisfy ourselves as a society <clears throat> that those who drive, fly, or otherwise move mass transit around this country are not doing so impaired by their drug use. Having said that, I'm absolutely convinced, based on 34 years in police work, and since the early 90s when I did some of my original drug use, drug policy research, um, convinced that this nation's war on drugs is the most abysmal, obscenely expensive, immoral domestic policy in the history of this country save slavery. We are spending billions upon billions upon billions of dollars to enforce laws that are fundamentally aimed, from my point of view, at punishing people that we have elected to demonize. People who use drugs as a civil right, people who abuse drugs and who have medical problems and who need help. But unless and until we can develop the courage within all strata of our society and particularly within certain fields like law enforcement to say enough that this is an extravagant waste of time and money and people. It is not just national in scope, it's clearly international as our drug policies punish um, indigenous peoples throughout the world and, and, and subsistence farmers in Latin America and the Middle East. I made a big mistake in this chapter. I called emphatically and with great confidence for decriminalization uh, of drug use and medical assistance and a public health policy for those who need it. When in fact what I really meant to say was regulated legalization. Jack Cole from Leap, he's wearing a t-shirt that says, ask me, <laughs> talk to me, <laughs> uh, can explain uh, in much better uh, detail the distinction between decriminalization and legalization. Legalization was the position I supported. Decriminalization is the wrong term that I attached to it. Um, the, the drug policy reform movement is not completely innocent. As I did my research, I found references to decriminalization and legalization used synonymously. But it is clearly time for us to accept the reality that this drug, this nation's drug policy and, and its war on drugs is an abysmal failure. And to shift the monies now being spent on interdiction, on the supply side, on enforcement, to the other side of the equation, to the demand side, by first allowing 
that demand to be satisfied by any adult who chooses to use any drug, any drug, and who in exchange for that choice makes a social contract to behave responsibly under its influence. You're driving down a street impaired, you're busted. You abuse your spouse, a child, you're busted. You rob a bank, you steal a car, you're busted. And don't even think about blaming it on being under the influence of any drug, including the most pernicious one in our society, which is alcohol. Don't for God's sakes, think that it's okay to furnish it to children, because it's not. You see, more and more people are beginning to recognize that we've got all the laws we need to deal with the harmful effects of any form of drug abuse which impinges upon the rights of others. <laughs> we, call them, we call them criminal statutes. So it's time, it's well past time, and I'm personally convinced that the, the most fruitful territory that we need to be um, plowing right now is law enforcement. I am not the only police officer, I am not the only police chief, former or present, who believes in what I've just shared with you. I was in Kansas City two weeks ago, a major city's chief came up to me and said, after having been given a free copy of the book the night before in a, uh, for a conference that we were all attending. Started your book last night. I said, oh, how far did you get? He said, I'm about midway through chapter three, which meant, of course, that he had read the drug, drug chapter, and I said, well, let me have it. Can't disagree with a thing. Makes perfect sense. It's logical. Why don't we try to be effective <laughs> in this process of dealing with this nation's drug problem. I said, that's music to my ears. Can I quote you? No. <laughs> Are you crazy? Absolutely not. <coughs> that he said it to me as a step. And, and, and I believe as a relatively new chief, as one of America's major cities, police chiefs, that he will in fact come around uh, to add to his wisdom the kind of very special courage it takes to speak out on this issue with, within um, our institutions generally and in law enforcement particularly. Last excerpt. <clears throat> I had to talk about David Brain because I'm in Tacoma. I have to talk about the World Trade Organization because I hail from Seattle. And it's not that I want to. I was out of the loop on the decision to invite the WTO Ministerial Conference to Seattle, November the 29th through December the 4th, 1999. I'm not sure how I would have voted anyway. For all I knew, WTO were the call letters of a Cleveland radio station. I will say this, though. Having your ass kicked so completely by protesters, politicians, the media, your own cops, colleagues from other agencies, and even a former friend, does give cause for pause and reflection. So I have done a lot of re reflection on the battle in Seattle. Uh, I make in this chapter another statement that makes me hunger for a second edition so that I can correct an impression that I made in the drug chapter and so that I can add to my own understanding uh, and share my own understanding with others about what happened in that fateful week during the battle in Seattle. On Tuesday of that week, having worked our way through a weekend and a Monday with relatively few problems, a handful of arrests, most of them applauded by most people in our community, uh, and having been approached by a woman who said to me, in the presence of David Horsey, the two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning cartoonist for the PI, I love you folks. I love my police department. That's why I'm here. Oh, by the way, I'm anti-globalization. So I'm also here to protest this conference, but to do so peacefully and non-violently. So having heard that and having expected on the following day to see a warm and fuzzy cartoon in the PI, I was really taken aback, to put it mildly, to see how large, how forceful, and how violent were 
small contingents within that larger mass of anti-globalization demonstrators in the city of Seattle. I went home and did a lot of studying when I learned that the WTO was coming to our city, having bested San Diego in competition for the honor. Um, my friends in San Diego never will let me live that one down. Uh, but I was, I was convinced that, um, that this was a dialogue well worth having. My own personal view, speaking as a private citizen, is that globalization has wrought horrific problems globally. They are worsening by the moment, and they continue to, to portend horrible abuses in human rights, civil rights, economic and social justice around the world. That's one person's opinion. It's obviously shared by many, many around the globe. But I was, in fact, Seattle's police chief in 1999, and my responsibility was to help all of us uh, achieve safe streets so that the dialogue, so that the demonstrations and the protests could proceed uh, apace throughout that week. I'll conclude by telling you that while I accept full responsibility for what happened, certainly for the police response to what happened. And rue to this day, uh, many of the decisions that I made, including one that I didn't make, which would have been to walk across the street and tell the mayor and every other politician in town that this city is too small for this conference. Upwards of 50,000 demonstrators, 8,000 ministers, international press, the president of the United States, um, the Secretary of State, assorted other very high-ranking officials. We didn't have enough people in the state of Washington, much less the county of King or the city of, of Seattle. And I should have recognized that early on and didn't. Um, and and, I'm, and I, I'm very regretful that I didn't. But I will also tell you that we made a big mistake on Tuesday morning of that week in gassing uh, several hundred, if not a thousand, demonstrators who had locked arms and set themselves in the intersection of Sixth and Union. We gassed them because we didn't have enough people. That was our rationale. We gassed them because the intersection was completely clogged and somebody on the 27th floor of the Sheraton might have been having a heart attack and you couldn't possibly get aid cars through there. I believed this. I, re I believed it as a cop. Give us at least a corridor, we would say to the demonstrators some space through which we could, in fact, get an emergency vehicle. We'll cut all other vehicular traffic. They weren't willing to do that. They wanted, for reasons that we all, I think, understand, the photo op, uh, civil disobedience, an opportunity to be arrested by the police in a highly visible way uh, and to be carted off to jail. We couldn't, we couldn't live up to our own promise to provide that because at the same time, simultaneously, were five other demonstrations or contingents of demonstrators converging on the downtown area. So a decision was made for those reasons to clear that intersection. Unlawful assembly was declared. Warning was administered repeatedly over and over and over. And then they were gassed. And that had the effect, the inevitable effect of radicalizing and making more militant many, many demonstrators who were on the streets of our city to protest globalization. I write in this book with great confidence, if not cockiness, that if I had that decision to make over again, I'd do it today, and I wouldn't. So I really need that second edition. <laughs> I need the opportunity to say that on my book tour, having heard from yet more demonstrators, and having had the opportunity to reflect for five years on that fateful decision, um, that it, w it really was the wrong choice. And, and it seems to me that we all need to learn everything we possibly can, uh, not only about massive demonstrations, um, protesting whatever, but also every other policy and practice of our police department. In the end, we are the people's police. The police in this country belong to the communities they serve. And the day of unilateral decision making needs to come to an end yesterday. Authentic partnerships between community and police 
to advise and to participate in the development of policies and procedures, program development, crisis management, and most critically, civilian oversight of our police agencies. And when, when, when we reach that level of true authentic partnership between community and police, we can create solutions to the kinds of problems that get symbolized in these huge blow-ups or in a Rodney King incident, an Amadou Diallo uh, or an Abner Luima incident. Police and community working seamlessly in true partnership not only to fight crime and solve problems but to ensure social justice for each and every one of us. That's the end of my talk, and I'm now prepared to take questions, comments, reflections that you may have. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yes. So uh, I'll try my best to, to sum all the topics you brought up into one word. I mean, whether it's the origins of domestic violence or the rise of paramilitarism in the police force or even WTO, it's control. But the tide is going really strongly, not in the favor of decentralization, of decontrol, but more control. Pick your topic. You know, the real, you know from the real ID movement to, to no child left behind to, I mean, everywhere you go, it's more centralized, top down, take it, you know, take it and like it control from every organ of big business, big government, whatever you pick. So my question to you is, you know, where, where do you push back? Where are you, where are you trying to, you know, what would you recommend to, to try and undo the way the tide is running? Community organization and mobilization is, is my immediate response to that. I was uh, uh, giving a reading at Powell's in, in Portland a couple of weeks back, and a fellow was sitting in the front row wearing a Kucinich t-shirt uh, under his shirt, uh, raised his hand when we got to this portion of the uh, presentation and he said, uh, you know, this stuff sounds really good. Demilitarize the police, legalize drugs, uh, get the government off our backs in, 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 in ways where we, the people, want them off our backs and bring them in to provide more support in domestic violence prevention and youth violence and so on and so forth, school violence. So he said, you know, it all sounds wonderful. It really does. But come on, let's be realistic. What can we really do? And I said, that coming from a man in a Kucinich t-shirt? Come on. Why, did, why, why were you behind that candidate? Because you believed in him on the issues that you raise. And he was nodding his head. And I, and I said, it really is a political proposition, fundamentally. The power of Americans who feel and believe, who, who, uh, as we do, and I, I make that assumption uh, with some confidence, but not complete, that we want the police to be accountable. We want them to be responsive and responsible. We want them to be tough crime fighters. Crime scares the bejesus out of us predatory street crimes, rapes, somebody stealing your car, that's no fun. We want good police protection and service and effective crime fighting. And we also want these other things that, that you've shared. That's not gonna come about <clears throat> through the work of any one individual or even small collection of individuals. It is gonna take a large number of Americans speaking out uh, and clearly uh, uh, you know, hauling their bodies into the polling booths at election time. I've never been more concerned about the direction of this country. The homeland security, the rubric of homeland security uh, is now being used as an excuse to pull away from community policing, to shift money out of crime prevention, domestic violence prevention and the like, and to what end? Uh, there's probably no one in this room that doesn't believe there's going to be another terrorist attack in this country. but. The last one was in 2001. And day in and day out on the streets of this city and every other city in this country, police officers are making awesomely important discretionary decisions. What are we doing to help them and the community work together to deal with <clears throat> the kinds of real crime problems that we face in the country? 
Other than that, I have no opinion. I, I, I think it's just vital that we organize and mobilize. Tipping point tells us it doesn't have to be 51%. It might be 8%, it might be 7 who knows? But it's real important, I think, that we band together and support one another and put aside turf battles in the interest of coalition politics, effective coalition politics. So, so what organizations do you belong to? Well, I just joined uh, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Um, I am on the board of the uh, San Juan County Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Services. Um, I continue to be a member of an organization called LISC, uh, which is the Local Initiative Strategic Corporation. They provide funding for community development, particularly in low-income areas. They're doing stuff on prisoner reentry. They're doing some really wonderful things. Uh, and I'm proud to be a part of that. And an organization that um, I recommend to everyone in this room, which is a fledgling uh, institute, is the Institute for, the, for Developing Police Leaders. My friend and colleague, Nancy McPherson, uh, now in uh, Portland, uh, is, is the founder. Uh, Robin Bowler is, is a, a, a um, senior fellow. Yeah. Never understood why it's fellow. <laughs> but, but the two of us are senior fellows on this and, and hoping to get financing for it. It's a wonderful program that aims to cultivate progressive police leadership, not at the top, because in effect it's too late, but at the lower levels, at the rank and file levels. These strong peer leaders who've got good sensibilities and a strong moral and ethical compass, we want to reach out to them and provide tremendous support over the course of 10 full years, uh, apart from a threshold training and education experience that will help them uh, do the kinds of things we're talking about from within. Yes, please. You said something <clears throat> at the very beginning that I'm not sure I understood correctly. But I thought I heard you say that as a young police officer or, or police officers abuse citizens, really confused me because I've never ever had that experience knock on wood thank God but part of that I think could probably be because I'm not doing the things that might want to make a police officer abuse me too and I don't know what part of that equation fits into that statement well if you had crossed paths with me or I with you during my rookie year in San Diego and you were male and particularly if you were of color and especially if you gave me any lip, I would try to find a way to bait you into taking a swing at me so that I could choke you out. But, but if I'm not, if I'm just walking down the street and I'm a good person and I'm not doing anything wrong, you wouldn't say, oh, there's a black man, let me pick on him, would you? Yes. Oh, okay. And I wasn't alone. Okay. Um, but not just any black man. It's got to be a young black man. It's got to be somebody um, who is signaling to me that he's questioning my power, my authority. And then I'm going to find a way, an excuse to stop him. And as I said, I'm going to taunt him or bait him into taking a swing at me. Um, I got my comeuppance at the hands of a prosecutor and people who know my personal story are well aware of this incident. I arrested a 19, this kid happened to be white, but I arrested a 19-year-old um, for no other reason than he had challenged my authority. He had some beer on his breath that gave me license, as I saw it, um, to arrest him. It was a false arrest. It was illegal what I did. But I hooked him up, put him in the back seat of my police car, and drove him to jail. I didn't screen test him, which is a tactic familiar to many in early police circles, which is to say, and this is how it would manifest on the police arrest report, while driving the defendant southbound on Fairmont, approaching Home Avenue, a, an orange and white striped cat darted in front of the undersigned police vehicle, causing the undersigned to slam on the brakes and forcing the defendant forward into the screen producing a waffle-like effect on his face. Inexcusable. 
and a, such a source of, of glee and pleasure when it was done. Physical violence, abuse. I get it now. I understand why that power went to my head. I didn't understand it at the time that I walked into the courthouse to uh, respond to this subpoena that I got on this 19-year-old. You don't go to you don't go to court on a straight drunk arrest in 1966-67. You pay your $29 and get on with your life. We sort of expected people to do that. Mm -hmm. No problem, I thought. I've seen how this is handled. So I saunter into the courthouse. I sidle up to the um, uh, deputy prosecutor, give him a wink and a poke, and say, I think you probably want to dismiss this case. He says, why? I say, it's skinny. He says, tell me about it. I said, well, he really had a very bad attitude. I'm cleaning this up. He really had a very bad attitude. He said, was he drunk? I said, what kind of question is that? He had a really he called me a pig. And I figured, you know, the wink and the poke, that's all we, we got it going between the two of us. I'd seen senior officers accomplish this. Was he drunk? No. Officer Stamper, does the Constitution of the United States mean anything to you? I was enraged. What right did he have to talk to me that way? To, what right did he have to challenge my authority? My rage very quickly turned to embarrassment, and by the time I slithered down the stairs of the, of the county courthouse, I was literally awash in shame. And that was, that was a defining moment in my life. Uh, there were other factors starting to converge, but, but I was forced to confront why and how I had changed so much in such a short period of time just by pinning on a badge and putting on a uniform and packing a gun and behaving in, 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 uh, in ways that were, for me, pleasurable but utterly disgusting. I also did some good police work during my rookie year, and I'm proud of that. But I think what's important to focus on is, you know, if we're all about reform and improvement is what's going wrong. And that was clearly something that was going wrong. Thanks. Yes, Robin. So when you acknowledge that you would see a young black man and if he, if he didn't kind of defer to you, in, in, in doing that, of course, you're definitely breaking a deep silence and white solidarity and police codes and all kinds of things. And so on the one, I kind of have a two-part question. I'm, I'm interested in how current officers are responding to you breaking silence on that and then whether um, it's getting do you I imagine that it would get dismissed as okay maybe some people did that back then but that doesn't happen now and I'm I'm so I'm also wondering what your perspective is on race relations with police and communities sure. of color today and if it's changed and just all of that. I'll start with the last one and work back um, it has changed there has been improvement and, and it's visible obvious improvement um, You'd have to be awfully stupid to use the kind of racial and ethnic slurs that I described in this book uh, that were taking place in the everyday vocabulary of police officers in the mid-70s. You'd have to be awfully stupid because in that police department in San Diego and in the one in Seattle, and I'm assuming in Tacoma, that will get you fired. And you cannot believe the debates we had about that. What? It's just words. <laughs> you know? Think of the grossest, most primitive and ugly and grotesque racial and ethnic slurs you can imagine. Those were in common use in the early stages of my career. And when it came time to finally confront that, with police chiefs saying, these walls have heard for the last time the N-word, use that word, the expression of our chief in San Diego was Converse hiring, because you're out of a job. Well, that's great, that's wonderful. Non-negotiable standards of performance and conduct. You wanna be a cop in this city? You gotta do these things and not do these things, otherwise you won't be. That's terrific, but it's far from enough. And as you too well know, having taught cultural competence uh, for many, many years and, and offshoots of that discipline, what's really needed now, especially in those departments that have made that progress, is cultivating an environment in which we can have honest conversation about race. And we are not there, not in any police department I know. I have a chapter entitled, Why White Cops Kill Black Men. It's intentionally provocative. 
but it raises very important questions that deserve to provoke honest conversation about white police officers' fears of black men. Why do you think I did what I did when I'd see a 17, 18, or a 25-year-old black male walking down the street giving me the eye? Because I was scared. Well, if you're scared, wouldn't you drive on by? No, I'm a cop. I'm not going to just drive on by. So I, I think, just to complete this answer, I think great progress has been made. I think the status of race relations in the society, as well as within our institutions, including particularly policing, um, is, is still dismal. I really do believe that. And I probably missed another part of the question, Robin, so you can... I'm just wondering what kind of reaction you're oh, getting from officers. Oh, it's really mixed. I've had some amazingly positive reactions. Um, I read the reviews on Amazon. I don't know if anybody can resist that. And there's a campaign to get me. It's real clear. Not, it's not to get me. It's to drive my sales down, I'm sure, and give me those one-star reviews. And I know, the voc I know who's writing them. You know, it's, and it's actually kind of humorous, particularly since my publisher keeps telling me, you want controversy. I said, no, I don't. I said, I, you know, this, this person's wrong. I think I need to reap. No, you don't. <laughs> no, 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 let it go. That's good. Is, is there a flip but there's side positive to that stuff chapter? too. Is there like what? A flip side to that, like black officers killing white men? No. For the same reason? No, because it's not there. There's no pattern. Is, is there. A, um, why are <clears throat> white officers afraid of black men and black officers not afraid of white men? I think it has to do with privilege status, entitlement. It has to do with my taking for granted my whiteness. If you are of color, you are the ethnic minority. Um, if you grow up in a police department, you are taught. I don't want to be unduly provocative. I was taught to recognize that black men, if I was going to get done as a cop, it was going to be at the hands of a black man who pulled a knife and stuck it between my ribs or a 32 out of his waistband and shot me between the eyes. I, I believe that. I honestly believe that because that is really what I was taught. Not in a class entitled, How Black Men Are Out to Kill White Cops. Right. It was in the stories that all the instructors told. You know, the sea stories, the accounts of what happened at 30th and Imperial, or 5000 Churchward, or 4700 Logan. And the cast was always white cop on black man. Do do black officers have that same fear of black youth also then? I would say as a generalization, no. As a generalization, no. Um, one of the officers, I interviewed 31 officers in 1976, asking each of them about their own practices and what they witnessed in policing the black community. This was in response to an investigation that we initiated which I think is another very positive sign in that police department in San Diego. One of my 31 cops was black. And this is officers assigned to the black community. It gives you a pretty good idea of how few black officers there were, there were in, that, in that police department at that time. When I began to ask this officer, this black officer, whether essentially he engaged in the same stuff that 30 other cops have basically copped out to, he said yes. And I had a series of questions that got into details and specifics. And he began weeping. Uh, it's not an unfair characterization to say that he was sobbing uncontrollably. He was ashamed, thoroughly ashamed of using racial and ethnic slurs. You know the answer probably. You've got to ask the question. Well, why, why did you do this? You go along to get along. It's a white world. It's a white locker room. The cops that cover you out there on the street that back you up, they're white. Tragic, just mm -hmm. tragic. Yes? How about one more question, then we want to have time for um, autographs. And Great, okay. thanks. Just, oh, I hate the pressure of asking the last one. It really <laughs> better be good. Man. It's really good. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious, uh, as a result of this discussion, this is asking you to generalize, but you've been comfortable doing that <laughs> with some other things earlier. Um, do you think the majority of people go into police work 
for altruistic reasons or because they like the idea of I will be this really powerful, fabulous guy that uh, can rough up those people that I want to rough up. Some show psychological traits that support that latter uh, premise, that they are authoritarian, mm -hmm. they're very control oriented, um, they have something to prove, something to establish, which was clearly my case. The badge becomes very heavy for those officers. The best solution to that, of course, is to keep the badge from them in the first place. Psychological screening uh, has taken great strides over the decades so that we're actually pretty good at, at screening out the blatantly unfit. We're not as good yet, IDPL, Institute for, the, for, for Developing Police Leaders, has a psychologist on board who is very, very good at helping us to get to a state of art where we can actually find those qualities that would be useful for, for police officers, not just the absence of bad, so to speak, but the presence of good qualities. Most police officers today, uh, whether they have an altruistic motive or not, are honest and honorable people. They're good people. My beef is not with cops. I love them dearly. Even some of the ones I've had to fire, I have tremendous respect and admiration for, however twisted that may sound. They tried, they, they just didn't succeed. Um, but there is, I, I think, a real problem in assuming that we can let the culture, um, as it exists today, absorb newcomers and not turn out officers who are cynical or sarcastic or who never smile or who are given to excessive force or who won't explain their actions or who worse engage in racist or discriminatory or excessive uh, conduct. So it's real important, I think, to, to, to look at the structure which gives rise to that culture which produces the events. It ain't the people. It's you and me. It's our society. We draw our cops from society at large. It's the structure. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Are you comfortable signing that? I am very comfortable. Thank you all so much for coming. Norm Stamper served as Seattle's chief of police from 1994 until his retirement in 2000. Breaking Rank is published by Thunder's Mouth Press. Visit avalonpub.com for more information.